There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy. There is joy. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy. There is joy. Yeah. Swim in the waters, we want to dance. There is a river flowing, a river of joy and laughter. We want to swim in the waters, we want to dance. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy. There is joy. Swim in the waters, we want to dance. There is a river flowing, a river of joy. In laughter, we want to swim in the waters, we want to dance. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy. There is joy. Joy in the house of the Lord. That was all the work, the work that's happening in Peru with our missionaries, the Woolbrinks, and Jason's going to share with us in just a little bit. But for now, let's stand up. Let's sing together. God can do anything. I search the world. Every desire 
and uh, we just want to say thank you for spending part of your Sunday right here with us. Um, a very special welcome to those of you that might be worshiping with us here for the first time. And if that is you, um, at this point in time, we just ask that you take out this card that says new here that's located in the seat back in front of you. Um, take a couple minutes while you're, uh, while you're getting settled in and probably thawed out from the uh, little uh, cold outside. Uh, put a little information down about yourself and then uh, go ahead and drop it off at one of the welcome tables back, uh, located in the back of the church. And uh, just let us know how uh, Calvary can come along on your faith journey. Um, you know, the Lord has instructed us to, uh, regardless of whether it's a joyful celebration or painful sorrow, to bring everything uh, to Him in prayer. Um, and this Friday night is uh, something that uh, Calvary has been doing now for a while. It's their annual night of prayer. Um, so starting uh, this Friday night uh, at uh, 4 p.m., uh, going through uh, Saturday morning, November uh, 4th at 6 a.m., um, we're going to go ahead and uh, be involved in a night of prayer. Um, ushers are going to be bringing down clipboards, um, and as they pass through your rows, just prayerfully consider uh, being a part of this. Uh, go ahead and sign up for an hour slot, a two-hour slot. Um, and just come into the house of the Lord um, in the still of the night and just lay everything down at his feet in prayer. If you've been coming here uh, to Calvary for a while and just want to know maybe a little bit more about things, um, next Sunday, mark it down on your calendar, November 5th uh, at 10.30, um, we're going to have an Explore, uh, Explore membership class. This is your chance to kind of uh, get a little, uh, little bit more information about Calvary, uh, meet some of the pastors and staff. So if this is something you're interested, definitely uh, plan on come checking it out uh, next Sunday. 
Um, speaking of our pastors and staff, um, October is uh, Pastor Appreciation Month, and uh, here at Calvary we are very blessed to have a great pastoral staff, so it is not too late to go ahead and drop a card or a token of appreciation um, to the Calvary Church office just thanking our pastors. Um, coming up uh, December 17th, uh, we're going to do something a little bit different this year. Uh, there's going to be an adult choir that's going to uh, uh, sing in both of these services. Pastor Mitch is going to have more information about this coming uh, in the next coming weeks or so. Um, but go ahead and mark this down on your calendar. If you are interested in uh, joining the, uh, the choir team, um, rehearsals will begin uh, Sunday, November 19th. As we often do, we just want to go ahead and uh, remind you of the three ways you can give here at Calvary. One is you can give your offering um, in uh, one of the black boxes located in the back of the church. Um, two, you can give on the My Calvary app. And three, you can give uh, online at www.mycalvary.org. Um, you know, one of the best things about Calvary, I think, is uh, we often uh, find out just how the Lord is using our tithes and offerings um, out in the mission and out across the world. Tonight, um, we're going to hear from a few missionaries. And so uh, tonight at 6.30, we're going to start with a, uh, a potluck dinner that's going to be out uh, in the back of the church here. And then we're going to move into here for a time of fellowship, uh, hearing from a couple missions. Um, and at this point in time, it is my, uh, my privilege to welcome up Jason Walbrink. He's the uh, mission from Peru, and he's going to tell us a little bit more about what he is doing. Thank you. Good morning, Calvary community. My family and I are your missionaries in South America, in Lima, Peru. And it's been a few years since I was here with you. 2019 was the last time I was here actually preaching the morning services. And uh, uh, remember, we went back the next month to Peru. We were here on some furlough time. We were really excited. We had plans. We were refreshed. We had the vision for the next stage. And we were ready to go. We actually got a building in 2019. The church was in my front yard. Pastor Ugo remembers because he spoke there. Uh, we got a building down the road. Things were growing. We were ready to rock in 2020 and change the world. And then COVID happened and shut everything down. And the shutdown in Peru wasn't like the shutdown here. We had an actual communist takeover in Peru during that time. Um, we're talking, we had to stand in line for hours with hazmat suits, three masks, and face shields. And they still took your temperature on your forehead just to get in the store. My kids were not allowed to leave the house for a year. The military was on the street beating up old ladies that would go out to buy food. The problem with shutdown in Peru is that 40% of Peruvians don't have a refrigerator. So it doesn't work very well to stay home. They have to go buy food to cook that day. And as things went on in 2020 during that shutdown, months into it, the people in our community started to put up signs that said it's better to die of COVID than hunger. And I remember we had already used all our resources to help families about six months into the shutdown. I was frustrated. There's a lot of corruption in Peru, and any help that came from the government was always stolen by the mayor and his cronies. And I was out for a jog one day trying to kind of get out of the frustration. I was making sure that the police weren't there to see me take my mask off as I ran. And I was telling God my frustration like any good Christian does, complain to God. You've done it, right? And I said, God, if only I had the resources, you know, to feed all these people. People are in need in our community. And that still small voice in my ear said, I have them. Go feed the people. All I need is someone with the faith to bring heaven to earth. So I went to our leadership team and I said, I heard from God. We need to feed the people. We started a project called Alimentos de Vida, which is food of life. And we did it in the, they wouldn't allow people to come into our church, so we did it on the sidewalk in front of our building. We put our speakers out with worship music, and we still had to wear these hazmat suits, but we got bags of food and bread and fruit, and we opened it up for hundreds of families every week. We prayed for them. We shared the gospel with them. People were desperate. People would come in tears. We gave them food, and God started to work, and we didn't have any money when we started this, when we announced it, but God miraculously provided we gave nearly $30,000 worth of food away to over 3,000 families in our community for months. It was amazing. We saw God work, and this was in, in 2020, and we, we had that, that light in the darkness like, God is doing something, and we're going to get through this. And, and then the country shut down for another year afterwards. Have you ever been excited and felt like you were on the mountaintop and God was working, and then the next day you hit the valley? Am I the only one that's ever had that? 
And you're like, but, 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 but I thought that, the, God, I thought that you were, you were doing a miracle. And there's this verse I found in Psalms 126.5. It says, those that sow with tears will reap with shouts of joy. You know, in those moments when we had saw God work and we were excited and then it was shut down again. And what do I do now? There were some tears. It didn't seem like we had any fruit. We just kept sowing, visiting. 2021, we were so discouraged. We had opened the church. The country shut back down again. Um, about August of 2021, we sat down with our leadership team. There were only five couples left in the whole church. And we said, we don't have the energy to relaunch this church again and start over. My wife and I, we already planted the church years before. Like, we can't do it again. What should we do? And we prayed about it, and they said, God, God shows us that we're going to do it. We're going to help you. So you weren't allowed out of your house on Sunday still because of COVID. So we started a Saturday service, Saturday night. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you now, Saturday night is full, and Sunday morning is full because it's open now. And it's a good thing because our building's not big enough. But in 2022, see that sowing with tears? also has reaping we didn't know what, what what we were planting that year but in 2022 we had 105 people come to christ and we baptized 50 people the video that you saw that's from 2023 that's this year activities and baptism and outreach from this year and we haven't even tallied up the numbers because god is still working this year and remember the best is always yet to come with god but the biggest thing that i learned is that god is a god that multiplies when you plant a seed, he multiplies it. But just remember this, he can never multiply what you don't give him. So I hope you join me tonight at the missions banquet. I'm going to share a couple of stories of lives that have been changed in our ministry, Fuente Vida, in Peru. And I hope to see you there at 630. God bless. Amen. Thank you, Jason. Stand with us and let's continue in our worship. God is good. He is our firm foundation. He is our solid rock. We can trust in Christ alone. He brings our hope. Thank you, God. Solid rock, I 
this morning. And just as a reminder, um, we do the reference, the verse, and then the reference again. And so let's go Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Philippians 3.10. Excellent. Excellent. Um, Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and worship you this morning. We pray for Israel and ask for your protection as they fight against those who want to destroy them. We lift up our leaders and our military as they stand with Israel. We think of all the men and women who are overseas and serving in our military. We ask, Lord, for your protection and provision. We lift up Adam and his unit in Kuwait and pray for his family and all the families who have loved ones that are serving. We also pray for Edith and her family and all the people of Acapulco after the hurricane. Lord, there are so many families that are suffering from the effects of cancer. We lift up our friends and family who are battling this disease. We pray for Lauren, Bonnie, Bridget, Sean, Pat, Brandy, Linda, and Jeannie's dad. Lord, would you please heal them and strengthen them. Heavenly Father, we pray for all those who are battling a variety of health issues. We ask that your hand of healing and comfort would be upon them. Lord, we pray for Deanna Castillo, Jody Nelms, Joanne, and Michael. We lift up David Hippen, who has been diagnosed with lymphoma. We lift up Kathy Ann, Olivia, Lindsay, Ray Hanayo, Amber, Deanna, Bob, Alaska, Everest, Wren, Macy's husband, Jake, Abraham Morgan, Mark Smith, Lisa Packett, Carter Rose, Alistair, Steve, Amanda, Paul, Brenda Brooks, Kathy Van Akron, Ken, Georgia, Sue Shaw, Rick's friend Randy, Eric's dad Larry, and Paula, and her heart enlargement. Lord, you know what each of these people are dealing with, and we ask for your hand and healing and strength to be upon them. Lord God, we pray for the families who are struggling spiritually and emotionally and the conflict and isolation it brings. We lift up Pam's family and the struggles Pam and her siblings are having. We pray for Kirsten's family, Destiny and her family. We pray for families who are mourning the loss of a loved one. We think of Renee and her family with the sudden loss of her mom. We lift up Ashley and Jeremy and Lincoln Green as they grieve the loss of Ashley's grandfather. Lord, we pray for the spiritual healing of Rochelle and Courtney. Heavenly Father, we pray for Nathan and Mackenzie as they are in the process of adopting a child. We lift up the birth mother, Amber, 
and ask for your hand to be on her and her pregnancy in due date in February. We lift up Rosemary in her pregnancy. We pray for Chauncey and Haley. Lord, protect these women and the babies you have blessed them with. We continue to lift up Harper, Jane, and Peter and ask that you would continue to strengthen and protect them. Heavenly Father, we pray for the many needs in our church and church family. We ask, Lord, for your hand of provision. We pray for Rochelle as she moves her salon. We pray for Michael and the Faustman family as they continue to work on the house. We pray for Sonia and Pam and Redemption Hill Bible Church, Warren, Breck, and Hannah, Micah, Lake, and Paxton, and Aspen. We ask for you to provide the physical and spiritual needs of each. Lord, we lift up all our family, friends, and neighbors who do not know you. We pray for Aaron, Carrie, Lauren, Nolan, Courtney, Ian, Sam, Phil, Kayla, Jeremy, Kaylee, David, Bill, Ken, Cindy, Naomi, Ryan, and Larry. Heavenly Father, we pray for a moving of your spirit and a softening of their hearts. Lord, help all of us to live lives worthy of the gospel and to be bold proclaimers of your truth. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen.
rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. Trusting in you is like building our house on the rock. And when we see this world, God, so many things built on the shifting sands of this world. We are so thankful that we have you, that we can build on you, our rock. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for being our firm foundation. You are so good to us, and you always have our best interests at heart. Help us to follow. Help us to be surrendered. I pray as Pastor Steve comes to open your book and, and preach your word, I pray that we will hear your voice, God. Speak to us. Reach deep down inside us and change us, shape us, make us more like your son, Jesus. It's in his name we get to pray. Amen. Amen. If you would, take your Bibles this morning and open them to the book of Philippians chapter 2. Now, if you use one of our Bibles, you'll find that on page 155 in the New Testament. And now if you found that, I want you to give yourself a pat on the back because we finally made it through chapter 1. And we only have three chapters to go, but we're not going to get in a hurry. This is good stuff, amen? And we're going to absorb all that God has for us in this letter to the Philippians. Last week when we discussed the last three verses of chapter 1, we discovered what it meant to live in a manner worthy of the gospel such a lifestyle demands three things first it demanded that we stand firm you see the terms christian and compromise are antithetical to each other they don't go together we stand firm on the absolute revealed truth of god and we don't waver we don't water down the message and here at calvary we don't seek to make the gospel more relevant to our time because it is good for everybody anywhere at any time. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. That is offensive to many because it is an exclusive claim to the truth. And we know that Paul said the gospel is offensive, but it's the truth. 
And it's the only truth that sets men free and makes them a child of God. So we stand firm. The second aspect of this lifestyle is that we strive together for the advancement of the gospel. Now think about this for a moment. Do you have an unsaved friend? Maybe you have a relative who has yet to come to faith in Christ. If you believe the Bible and if you really love them, then you are going to seek an opportunity to share with them the good news. And as a church, if we take seriously the Great Commission, then we too will take the necessary steps to get the gospel everywhere we can. But be warned, whenever you try to advance the gospel, you will meet resistance. You will encounter warfare of the spiritual variety. And it is then that we may experience suffering, which is the third distinctive of living in a manner worthy of the gospel. It may come in the form of ridicule. You may be ostracized. It may cost you your job, your freedom, in extreme cases, maybe even your life. But remember this, there was a great missionary in the 1950s to Ecuador, Jim Elliott. Perhaps you've read his book, Through Gates of Splendor, written by his widow. It was one of those books I read as a young man that truly changed my life. Jim Elliott said, He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Jesus put it this way, What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And whenever we lay down our lives for the sake of the gospel, rest assured that our sacrifice is not in vain. The early church father, Tertullian, said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And the more blood the Romans shed, the more Christianity took root and multiplied. And despite the opposition that we encounter, the church will be victorious. Through Christ, we're unstoppable. Now let's move on to chapter 2 today. Look at verse 1, particularly that first word. Paul begins by saying, Therefore... Now, a good rule of thumb is that whenever you're reading the Bible and you see the word therefore, it means you should go back and reread the verses that precede it. That way you can see what the therefore is there for. So look back up the last two verses of chapter 1. Paul wrote, For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. So he's talking about suffering. And he's going to continue that idea in chapter 2. Paul said, All who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You can count on it. If you take your stand for Christ, if you strive to advance the gospel, you are going to bump into persecution. So how do we sustain our faith? During persecution. Well, in the book of Acts, we read about the time when the apostles were brought before the council and they were threatened and told to never again preach in the name of Jesus. Look at how they responded. So they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. So, facing persecution, we are to have that same attitude. But that's easier said than done. Fortunately, in chapter 2, Paul is going to give us some assets that we can depend upon to help us in time of persecution, and there are four of them. Now look with me now at verse, uh, verse 1 again of chapter 2. Paul wrote, Therefore, if there is any... Now here's the first of four assets. Write it down. Encouragement in Christ. Now you dig a little deeper and study that word in the Greek you'll learn that encouragement is the Greek word periklesis. It refers to the lifting up of one's spirit. And in times of trial, suffering, or persecution, we find encouragement in none other than the person of Jesus Christ himself. Look at what the writer of Hebrews had to say. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens... Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. 
but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see, Jesus connects with us in our suffering because he knows exactly what it's like. In fact, it's during these times that we come to know Christ on a much deeper level. One of my favorite authors, C.S. Lewis, put it this way, We can ignore even pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. When we're suffering, it is then that we hear the voice of God more clearly than ever because it's in those times that we desperately need him and our hearts cry out for his presence and Jesus draws near and supplies us with encouragement because he can empathize with us. He knows what it's like to suffer. The sufferings of Jesus are the only answer as to why a good, all-powerful God would ever permit evil and suffering in the world. British pastor R.W. Stott said, I could never myself believe in God if it were not for the cross. In a real world of pain, how could one worship a God who is immune to it? I've entered many Buddhist temples in different Asian countries and stood respectfully before the statue of Buddha, his legs crossed, arms folded, eyes closed, a ghost of a smile playing around his mouth, a remote look on his face, detached from the agonies of the world. But each time after a while, I've had to turn away. And in imagination, I have turned instead to that lonely, twisted, tortured figure on the cross. Nails through hands and feet, back lacerated, limbs wrenched, brow bleeding from thorn pricks, mouth dry and intolerably thirsty, plunged into God-forsaken darkness. He said, that is the God for me. He laid aside his immunity to pain. He entered our world of flesh and blood, tears and death. He suffered for us, and our sufferings become more manageable in light of his. You see, Jesus knows the depth of human despair better than anyone. He hung there on the cross. One of the last things he said was, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus knew what it was like to be forsaken, even by his heavenly Father. And therefore, there is no painful experience we could ever encounter in this world that Jesus cannot connect with. Several years ago, around this time, I was called to the hospital on a Saturday afternoon. One of our teachers here at Parkview Christian had a little boy who slipped into the pool and tragically drowned. And I arrived at the ER, and the staff was working frantically trying to revive the little boy, but it was too late. So when the staff finally acknowledged that the little boy was gone, they withdrew from the room respectfully to give the family a few minutes to grieve and it was here the family invited me in you know the death of a loved one is always difficult even if you see it coming and have time to prepare but as many of you have experienced when death takes a loved one unexpectedly that's very difficult to process exponentially more so if it's a child and no parent should ever have to bury their child but it happens That afternoon, I struggled to find the right words to say as those parents stood there grieving over the body of their son. I prayed and I asked God to give me the words to say, but guess what? He didn't give me anything. Instead, he impressed upon me to walk over to the mother and take the little brother from her arms so that mom and dad could comfort each other in that dark hour. You know, I didn't have to say anything. You know why? Jesus was already on the job encouraging them, comforting them, consoling them in, no, in, in ways no human could ever pull off. And I'll be honest with you, I've never seen so strong a faith as theirs in a moment of crisis. How were they able to exhibit such strength? Literally, when their whole world just came crashing down on top of them, I can tell you why. Jesus, in those moments, lifted them up. He was there for them. And I promise you, 
he will be there for you as well. Paul said, if there's any encouragement in Christ, let's move on. Look at the second asset. If there is any consolation of love. Now, those two words go powerfully together. Consolation is the Greek word paramutheon, and it means alleviation. Love is a word we're familiar with. Love is the word agape, the overwhelming, never-ending, conditional kind of love exhibited by God the Father. So as an act of love, God alleviates our burdens. Now imagine that you are carrying a heavy load and someone shows up who is bigger and stronger than you and takes the load off your back and carries it for you. Now, when my wife and I get ready to take a trip, here's how it all goes down. If we leave on Friday, my wife begins packing on Monday. And she has the big suitcase. And since we only have one piece of luggage, I'm left with a, with a little gym bag. So we're going to go on a trip for a week. She gets the suitcase, I get the little bag. And so then I have to go up the stairs and my wife says, I can't carry this downstairs. It's so heavy. So instead I pick it up and I find out, honey, that's not that heavy. You know why? I'm stronger than my wife in one aspect. She's stronger than me in many others. But when it comes to lifting heavy things, I can handle that. I want you to imagine right now that you're carrying a heavy load and then someone shows up who is bigger than stronger than you are. Takes it off of you. And what seems impossible for you to bear is absolutely no problem at all for the everlasting arms of Jehovah God. Whatever you're bearing this morning, God wants to carry it for you. Look at this great promise in 1 Peter. Peter said, Therefore humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at proper time. Casting. Literally, that means to roll. Roll all of your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. It's no secret that in our nation right now, we are experiencing an unprecedented mental health crisis. Almost every week, we see this play out in, in various ways, mostly evil. Right now, people are trying to carry burdens that are impossible for humans to carry. Our nation is more secular today than ever before in our history. Large swaths of our population have no knowledge of God. And so the weight of these burdens is breaking them emotionally. And they need God. Perhaps you're here this morning and you have a great deal of anxiety over your future. It's uncertain. Your finances. You have more month at the end of the money, right? You have the, that familiar? Your children, maybe even your health, don't even think about bearing the weight of these burdens of lo alone. I can tell you it's too much for you. Why don't you avail yourself to the consolation of love offered by your loving Heavenly Father? His strength can bring you peace of mind. Paul said if there's any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, let's read on. Here's the next asset. If there is any fellowship of the Spirit. Now bear in mind, these are things that we can draw upon in the crisis and trials of life. The Greek word there for fellowship is the word koinonia. Anytime that word is used, it always refers to the closeness of a relationship. The way Paul uses it here in Philippians 2 means literally the sharing of the Spirit. And by the way, maybe you've noticed that these assets are arranged in a Trinitarian formula. The Bible teaches that God is three in one, Father, Son, and Spirit, and it's right here in this passage. The encouragement comes from the person of Christ. Agape love originates from God the Father. Here, fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Now, I've mentioned this before, but let me repeat it because it's so important. Whenever you repent of your sins and believe in Jesus, you receive the Holy Spirit. That is, the third person of the Trinity, 
comes and takes up residence in your mind and his number one priority is to change you into the image of Christ. He wants to make you like Jesus. But he's also there for another reason. He's there to be your friend. He's there to come along beside you. So that whatever situation you may find yourself in in life, you are never alone. In fact, in Hebrews, he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Now, because the Holy Spirit is God, that also means he exhibits all the attributes of God, one of which is omnipresence. He can be everywhere at once, which means the same Holy Spirit that lives in my heart also dwells in the hearts and minds of every single person on earth who repents and believes in Jesus. But the fellowship of the Spirit means way more than just having something in common with other believers. It also means that we can have personal interaction and fellowship with God's Holy Spirit. You say, how can we do this? Well, there's two ways. The first is through our prayer life. Look at this marvelous passage in Romans chapter 8. Paul wrote, In the same way the Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit, also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should. You ever gone to God in prayer and just don't know what to say? You don't know what to pray for? But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Sometimes the pain is too great. The depths of despair has inundated our souls where we don't even know what to pray for. It's in these times that the Holy Spirit goes directly to the Father and he prays for us because he knows exactly what we need. My, what a promise. So we fellowship with the Spirit through prayer. There's another way, and that is we also fellowship with the Spirit through His ministry of illumination. Now you say, what is that? Let me define it for you. Illumination is the act of the Holy Spirit in which He causes us to understand the Word of God. In the Scriptures, it's called enlightenment. And here's just one verse of many. I could have read several. Let me just give you this one. Jesus said in John 14, But the Helper, or the Paraclete, the one called along beside you to help, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Now here is how you engage in the, the, the teaching known as illumination. Tonight or this morning when you read the Bible, whenever you do your quiet time, you open up the Word of God, and before you begin reading, you pray, Holy Spirit, please help me to understand what it is I'm about to read. And the Holy Spirit literally will enlighten you as to the truths of God's Word. That's how you have fellowship with the Spirit. Now look at verse 1 again. Here's the last asset. If any, two words here, affection and compassion. They describe the same things, though, in slightly different ways. Affection is the feeling. Compassion is how you display that feeling. And throughout the Bible, we read over and over again that God has strong feelings for us. You ever feel unloved, unwanted, cast aside? Here's what God says about you. David said, just as a father has compassion on his children. So the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Fathers, think now about the love that you have for your kids. You'd do anything for them, wouldn't you? I mean, what father does not love his children? Well, your heavenly father loves you with a love that surpasses any love ever given by a human father. He loves you with a perfect love. And Jeremiah the prophet tells us how he expresses it. Lamentations chapter 3. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. You see, God is loving. 
God is kind. And God expresses his compassion continuously. It always flows from his character. Every single sunrise brings new manifestations of the love of God expressed in different ways. If we would but slow down our lives and open up our eyes spiritually to see how God is working. Let's move on to verse 2. Paul said, here's the title of today's sermon, Make My Joy Complete. Now we've said that joy comes from knowing Jesus. Sitting there in that prison cell in Rome, Paul's heart was filled with joy over what he heard that God was doing through the believers at Philippi. But it wasn't quite full yet. So now he's going to tell them how they can completely fill his joy. And they can do this by making some minor adjustments to their attitude. Let's look at those. Here's the second thing, an attitude to develop. He said, make my joy complete by being of the same mind or like-minded. That means they all hold the same opinions or render the same judgment. Now, if you've been around the church for very long at all, you'll know that can be a pretty tall order. Because if you have a room full of 100 people, you will find a 100 different opinions. In fact, if it's a Baptist church and it's 100 people, you will find 110 different opinions. But then we're not talking about matters of a non-essential nature here. You know, Pastor Shane has an opinion here that the Dallas Cowboys are the greatest team ever. I do not share that opinion. In fact, I have a strong opinion against that. I feel that nobody who pulls for the Dallas Cowboys should be allowed to enter the kingdom of heaven. (laughs) But that's not truth. That's an opinion. We're going to have a wide diversity of opinions among our church family about a variety of topics, and it's here that we give each other grace. We don't break fellowship over non-essential things. You know, we spent close to... I think 53 or 54 Sundays studying the books of Revelation and Daniel. You know, there are a lot of people who believe the Word of God, believe Jesus is the Son of God, who don't agree on the time of the rapture. We have diversity of opinion here in this body. I firmly believe that Jesus Christ is coming back before the tribulation. I can give you 26 reasons as to why I hold that position. But at the same time, we have some very strong Bible scholars who have differences of opinion. We don't break fellowship over that. You know why? Because we all agree that one day Jesus Christ is coming back. And I sure hope it's soon. Amen? I like to see this world just get fixed once and for all. And it's only going to happen when Jesus comes. But we don't break fellowship over non-essentials. But we must have doctrinal unity when it comes to the essentials of our faith. And in the rest of verse 2, Paul gives us three ways that a church can have the same mind. Let's look at those together. Look back at verse 2. Maintaining the, write this down, same love. Now, we've already saw the consolation of love in verse 1. Here we see the word again. The idea here is that the same love that comforts us also draws us together as the body of Christ. People whose hearts are filled with the love of God will naturally get along with other people whose hearts are filled with the love of God. This past week I watched a video that just really thrilled my heart. It was a testimony of a former Hezbollah fighter who shared his testimony about how he came to faith in Jesus. Let me share it with you. Afshin Javid, author of the book As Easy as Drinking Water, told CBN in a new interview that he formerly was a devout Muslim and Hezbollah soldier, get this, who admired Adolf Hitler, but believed the Nazi leader didn't finish the job. This is a bad dude. Hezbollah is a militant group and political party within Lebanon to Israel's north, in fact, They're shelling Israel at this time, and Israel's fighting back. Here's what he said. I was on my way to the United States to convert Christians to Islam, and I had 30 illegal passports. I was arrested and put in jail in Malaysia. I was a dedicated Muslim 
who not only prayed the prayers, but I also read the entire Quran once every 10 days, cover to cover. So I was dedicated while in jail. But it was in this jail cell that his life was changed. One day as I'm praying, a man appears in front of me, normal size, but his being shines like light. By the way, this is a common testimony of Muslims who are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. If you want a great book, pick up the book by the late Nabil Qureshi called Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. I'm telling you, I took that book with me to Nicaragua one time when I was teaching in the seminary there, and it was so good, I stayed up all night reading it. I could not put it down. But Muslims are testifying that Jesus is appearing to them. And this is what happens. He said, this light is not a normal light. This light carried identity in it, and I knew that he was holy, and instantly I knew that I was not. Even though I had prayed so many prayers, even though I had fasted so much, and even though I had read the Koran, <laughs> I had volunteered to work on landmines. I mean, imagine that as a church. Today we're going to build landmines to kill people. That's what he was doing. And even though I had participated in hanging people to try and please Allah, I knew even though I had kept all the rules and regulations of Islam, I knew I was not just and I'm not holy. And the only thing for this just and holy being to do was to kill me. But I didn't want to die. So I ran to the corner of the room. I held my head in my arms and just cried out shouting, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. But I didn't believe he would. But then I felt a touch on my arm, and he said, I forgive you. And I felt the weight lift off of me. And I knew I was forgiven, but I didn't know how. And I was confused, so I said, I don't understand. Only God can forgive, but you just forgave me. You are God, but you're a different God than the one I've studied about. You are not Allah. So who are you that forgives me? And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I thought, that's very powerful. As a Muslim, you pray, show me a straight path. And so the way is a direction. Truth is something you measure. Life is a source. But this divine being claims to be all three. I never thought the way is a person, the truth is a person, life is a person. And all of them are the same person. So I said, I don't understand. What is your name? And he said, I am Jesus Christ. And it was as if someone grabbed all my bones out of my body and I just fell like a piece of meat to the ground and I began to weep. He says, it's like, you know, being colorblind and then suddenly you see colors and you realize the world is so much more beautiful than you ever thought. And if you ask me what makes the world so colorless, it's the hatred, the anger that is in the heart of every Muslim. Do you know what he's doing now? He founded a ministry that's trying to connect Jews and Iranians. He was changed by Christ. He was changed by the love of Jesus. And as I heard that testimony this week, I couldn't help but think as to how it bore a striking resemblance to another who once killed in the name of religion. You know who that was? It was the man who wrote Paul, uh, who wrote the book of Philippians. Writing to Timothy, he said, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful putting me into service even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief and the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus and this is one of my favorite verses in all the Bible Next to John 3.16, this is number two. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy so that in me as the foremost Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. You see, the same love that changed us all from sinners to saints is the same love that brings us all together and makes unity possible. Look at the next part of verse 2. Maintaining the same love, write this down, united in spirit. Now that word translated united in spirit is a single Greek word which occurs only one time in the New Testament. It's the word sumsukoi. 
literally means together in soul. This is the union of thought and emotion. Maybe you've heard someone say, well, my head tells me one thing, but my heart tells me something else. You ever heard that? If you hear somebody say that, you know there's no unity of thought and feeling there. They're at odds. Well, sunsukoi, or united in spirit, means the thinking and the feeling are on the same page. Having the same mind means your feelings are controlled by your thoughts, and your thoughts are controlled by the truth of God. And a church that is filled with believers who all have the mind of Christ Thinking and feeling the same way is a body of believers who can change the world. The collective power of the Holy Spirit wielded through such a body is a powerful force for good in the community. And may God make us like that. Now look at the last part of verse 2. Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit. Here's the third thing, intent on one purpose. Paul said, I want you to all collectively focus your energy and efforts into getting people into heaven. But let's move on now to the final thing, which is an action to deliver. Beginning in verse 3, Paul wants the believers to move from attitude to action, and he is going to ask them to do one specific thing. He begins in verse 3 with a prohibition. He said, do nothing from selfishness. Or don't ever be motivated by selfish ambition. We know that ambition can be a powerful thing. It can be positive as long as it is controlled and directed in the right way. But unbridled ambition will burn you down. It'll destroy you. And if reaching your goals requires that you destroy the people around you, you have the wrong goals. Paul said, do nothing from selfishness. Here's the second thing or empty conceit. What's that? That's vainglory. That happens when we engage in activities that only brings glory to ourself. Paul said, don't do that. Everything we do, every activity we participate in, we do so for the glory of God. In 1 Corinthians, he said, whether therefore you eat, think about that, when you go home and eat today, are you eating for the glory of God? Whether therefore you drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Every single activity I engage in, whether it's work or play, is done so that my life can bring glory to our Heavenly Father. Now here's the admonition. He said we have a prohibition there. Now we have an admonition. But with humility of mind, we engage in activities with a deep sense of your own littleness. That's what humility is. You don't ever get to the point where you view yourself as being big or having arrived, but you always remain small in your own eyes. In fact, that was Saul's problem. When God confronted Saul about his sin, he said, when I made you king, you were small in your own eyes. But after a while, position and power got to your head, and you became arrogant. And that arrogance destroyed the first king of Israel. You know, the concept of humility wasn't always a, a positive asset, especially in Roman times. It was not regarded as a virtue. Biblical commentator Richard Mellick points out that the term humility was frequently employed by the Romans to describe a slave mentality. It conveyed ideas of being base, shabby, unfit, mean, or of no account. Typically, we don't like to think of ourselves in those terms. But what may be despised in the eyes of the world is adored in the eyes of God because God loves humble people. He said, with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. He said, shift the focus off of yourself and instead place the focus on others. You see, that is the role of a servant. And the greatest example of servanthood in the Bible is Jesus Christ. And I invite you 
to come back next week as we explore one of the most awesome passages in the entire New Testament, Philippians chapter 2, verses 4 through 11. In these passages, we will learn that Jesus humbled himself and he came down to this earth not to be served, but to serve. And he came to seek and to save those who were lost. And if you're lost today, he's looking for you. Don't run and hide. Let me advise you to run to him. Repent of your sins and believe in him. And he'll save you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity we've had to come together and discover, Lord, the assets, the attitude, Lord, the action that we are to take. Father, I pray this week that when we encounter trial or tribulation, Father, that we would, Lord, look back to Philippians chapter 2, verse 1, and discover the resources that you have, been, you have made available to every one of your children. And Father, I pray that we would suffer for your glory. Father, we pray that you'd help us with our attitudes this week. Help us as a church to be like-minded. Father, please remove the division if there be any among us. We pray, Lord, that we would be of the same mind and, Father, that we would all have the same intent, which is to get people into heaven. And then, Father, I pray that as we interact with our, with, with our church family this week and with the world, God, that we would not think of ourselves. Father, we would not be overrun with self-glory or self-ambition. but Rather, God, we would be consumed with meeting the needs of others. And, Father, we pray for any among us today who doesn't know you as their Savior. I pray, dear God, they would find you as their Savior today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you for coming and visiting with us today. If today is your first time, we want you to do something. Go by our visitor welcome table. We have a special gift just for you, just a token of our appreciation for having worshipped with us today. And church, if you are a member of Calvary, I want to remind you to please be faithful to the Lord with your tithes and offerings. You heard from one of our missionaries earlier. And my, what a blessing he is. And God is using him in a great way. You know what? His ministry would not be possible were it not for the tithes and offerings of God's people. And so I want to encourage you to be faithful. Every week, our staff reaches out and helps some of the poor of our community. Right now are difficult times for a lot of people. Our church on a weekly basis helps the poor and needy. And once again, that would not be possible if it weren't for your generosity. So I, I encourage you to remain faithful to the Lord as you have been. Now, tonight we have a very special activity. Our missions committee has put a Calvary mission dinner together for us at October 29th. And that means we're going to be having food. And so we want you to come for the missionaries, but there also will be food there. And uh, we will have a time of fellowship. It begins at 630 just right out here in the Calvary Connections Cafe, and then we'll hear from our missionaries after dinner. Now, we have another activity coming up next Saturday at 5 p.m. Uh, Parkview Christian School is hosting a gala. Uh, it's, it's their fundraising efforts. We have a great ministry here in our Christian school, and um, they, they're attempting to raise more money. And so if you're interested in going to their gala, you can purchase tickets. Today is the last day you can purchase them at Parkview Christian School. Dot org. Please go there and visit. Now, because we're a church family, we do want to celebrate the accomplishments of our young people. And um, I don't think I see uh, the two we recognized last week, but I do know that Cameron Collins is here. Cameron, would you stand up? Church, let's give him a hand. He's part of the North Star football team that made the playoffs this year. And uh, I left him out last week, so it's my bad. I want to make sure we honor him. I know he's working hard. He's a wonderful young man, great parents, and he's a great athlete. North Star did great this year in football, and even though they lost their playoff game, they're a young team, and we look forward to hearing great things from our young people in the future at North Star. Also, we want to congratulate Lincoln Lutheran Volleyball. One of our girls, Bella Suits, is going to state, and so let's give her a hand. And then Malcolm football team, they won their playoff game, and one of our young people, Noah Van Every, called a touchdown pass. So let's give him a hand. And then Parkview Christian, they won their first round playoff game this past Friday, and they play Potter Dix this coming Friday. And you say, where's Potter Dix? Go to the edge of the known universe and hang a right, and you'll find it. No, it's way out past Sydney. 
And so that is a long, long drive, but uh, they play this week, and we're praying for them. Pray for their safe travel, and, you know, pray for a victory if it's the Lord's will. Hey, we're a family. If uh, your young people are, uh, has any accomplishments you want us to recognize, we'll take the time to do it because we want our young people to know we love them. And the family, the household of faith, it supports them and loves them. And uh, we're, we're happy to recognize those. So if uh, you, you want me to recognize your young person, just send me a text or email or let me know, and we'll make sure we, we recognize them. We hope to see you tonight. May God bless you, and uh, we look forward to seeing you. Have a good day.